which is in consonance with these three criteria is regarded as acceptable. And may I show you, uh, viewers, that uh, if I uh, show you this Quran before me and I open up any page of the Quran, you'll find on, on, on its sides on the, uh, that you, the other variant readings of a particular verse which is mentioned in the main text uh, are, are mentioned uh, in the margins. And you can see that there's hardly a page in this whole corpus of the Quran which is devoid of any variation in this reading. And this variation in reading, again, as I said, is basically uh, acceptable to all our scholars if these readings conform to these standards which I have just narrated before you. And viewers, also interesting is the fact that these, uh, these uh, uh, readings, as I said, at times they do not have a very significant change uh, in the meaning, but at many a time we have significant changes in the meaning as well. Because when words change, when, the, when we find that there is a difference in declensions, in the verb patterns, in nouns, the mean, meaning obviously changes. And just to quote a very uh, glaring example, in again uh, the same verse, uh, Surah Maida's sixth verse, we find that in the case of dry ablution or tayammum, uh, now one verse has the words awla mastumun nisa, or I would say most versions, uh, which means that if uh, men have had intercourse with their wife, with their wives, and they find uh, they don't find water for ablution, then they can do tayammum. However, in one of the other versions, which is uh, one of the other recitals, which is uh, attributed to Hamza, uh, a famous reciter of, of Kufa. Uh, the words are lamastumun nisa, which means that this is only allowed if uh, a husband has kissed or touched his wife, and uh, then he finds no water, and he, then he can do dry ablution. So in lamastumun nisa, the version which says lamastumun nisa, it would mean that dry ablution is allowed in the case of sexual intercourse between your husband and wife. But in the case, in the if the verse is read as lamastumun nisa, that is without an alif, it would mean that only it is only allowed if they have kissed or touched each other. So you can see that uh, merely this variation produces a difference in directives as well. So the question arises that uh, if we have to accept any recital as the Quran, the obvious question which, which, could, which would come in my mind would be that it has to be sanctioned by the Almighty or by his prophet. Now, lo and behold, here we find neither, neither the Almighty nor the prophet sanctioning these recitals uh, or not giving any criteria of accepting these recitals. These criteria have been formed by our scholars of the Ummah. When I say these three criteria, it means that these three criteria have not been given to us by the Almighty, not been given to us by the Prophet Muhammad wasallam himself. It is the scholars of the Ummah who say that any recital, any reading of the Quran, any qiraat of the Quran, if it conforms to these three standards, then it shall be held acceptable. So as I said, the question which arose in my mind is that why? Only God and his prophet should be given or has been given or invested with this authority of regarding anything to be the, the Quran. So how can we regard something which a scholar of, of the Quran who is perhaps a, a hundred or two hundred years, who lives a hundred or two hundred years after the revelation of the Quran, who has given him the authority to decide what the Quran is and what it is not? The third question, viewers, which arose in my mind <coughs> is regarding uh, in certain narratives which are found in our canonical hadith books, which give us this very, very stark impression that the Quran we have today with us is incomplete. The Quran we have today with us is not complete. It is imperfect. It has uh, something which has been left out. Uh, and I can uh, quote many examples, but mm, for the uh, lack of time, I would content myself in citing two very common examples which are perhaps uh, known uh, to any student of the Quran who has studied the history of the Quran. So uh, the, the third question, as I said, which struck my mind and which uh, caused a lot of doubt in my mind was that we have this impression that the Quran we have today is not complete. Now the first of these verses is the stoning verse uh, which is found in, uh, in Bukhari. Uh, it's also found in the in Muatta of Imam Malik, but the version that I am now uh, presenting before you uh, is, is a hadith which is from Sunan of Ibn Majah. 
And you can see that the words are very startling and which tell us that a particular verse of the Quran had been left out from the Quran and it, is not, it still exists in certain ahadith and uh, it was part of the Quran but it no longer is part of the Quran. And let me also point out the fact that no other person than Umar ibn al-Khattab himself has, uh, is, he is the person who narrates this hadith. So um, the uh, words as recorded in the Sunnah of Ibn Majah are Qala Umar ibn al-Khattab Lakad khashitu an yatula bin na zaman Hatta yakula qailun ma ajdur rajam fi kitab illah Fayadillu bitar ki faridatim min faraid illah Ala wa inna rajam haqqun Iza uhsinat rajul Wa qamat al-bayyina Aw kana hamlun aw i'tiraf Wa qad qara'atuha Al-shaykhu wa al-shaykhatu iza zanaya Farjumuhuma al-battata Rajama Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa rajamna ba'da. Umar ibn al-Khattab said, I fear that time will pass over people until someone will say, I do not find the worst of stoning in the book of God. So in this way, people will be led astray by abandoning a directive from, the, from other directives or from among the directives of God. Bear in mind that stoning is the rightful punishment for a married person who has committed adultery. And it is established through evidence or pregnancy or confession. And I have read, Ashaykhu wa shaykhatu iza zanaya farjumuhuma al battata. This is the verse which Umar said has been left out from the Quran. And it means necessarily stone to death the married man and the married woman guilty of adultery. So this is what the conventional translation of this word is. God's messenger stoned criminals for this crime, and so did we after him. So this is the verse of the Quran which is operational today on, which, uh, on the basis of which punishments are given today by our conventional scholars the way they understand it, but it is no longer found in the Quran. Another example here is the suckling verse and this I cite, this hadith I cite from the Sahih of Imam Muslim. And here the, this hadith has been cited by none other than Aisha Rizala Anha. So the words are An Aisha ta annaha qalat kana fi ma unzila min al-Qur'an ashru raza'at ma'lumat yuharrimna summa nusikhna bi khams ma'lumat fa tuwaffiya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa hunna fi ma yuqra'u min al-Qur'an Aisha stated among what was revealed in the Qur'an was that 10 known suckling drops of milk of a uh, uh, of a child will make him a foster son and hence make him prohibited to marry. Later, this was abrogated in a verse which mentioned five known drops. God's messenger died and the verse which mentioned these five drops was among what was being read from the Quran. So Aisha Anha is supposedly saying that what makes a person as a foster, uh, foster son or a foster child is, the, is a suckling verse which says that 10 drops of milk when they are uh, when they are drunk by a child and he becomes a foster child and she says that this was abrogated by another verse in which instead of 10 drops they were, it was mentioned that 5 drops of milk are sufficient to make a child as, as a foster child and what she says which is uh, something which is very eye catching is uh, she says that the prophet died, the prophet died, and this word, this verse was among those that was being read from the Quran. And viewers, we know that the, today's Quran no longer contains this verse. So the words are, Wahunna fima yukrao min Quran. These verses from among the Quran were from among the Quran when the prophet died. And we obviously, as I said, these no longer exist. So these two are very uh, prominent and glaring examples which testify to the fact that uh, the Quran we, we have today, if we, if, if we go by these narratives, is incomplete. So as I said, this was a third question which struck me when I began my research. The fourth question which confronted me in this regard was, that as I read through various research manuals and histories of the Quran, I found, and obviously this is something which is of established nature, that the Quran we have today has scribal errors. 